Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kids Independent Media Production. Today we are talking about a wildly important subject. Triage, repair, surviving the house kit. This doesn't have to be a gig kit, first of all. It could be a rehearsal space as well. What we're talking about is drum sets that get used by a lot of people, get beat up, things get broken. What do we do when we need to sound our best on such an instrument? The types of scenarios that we're dealing with here in this episode are ones where it's impossible for you to actually bring your entire drum set, whether it's a rehearsal scenario or a gig scenario. But the bottom line is you cannot bring your own drums. You must use the ones that are provided. What do we do when we're under these circumstances? When it comes to addressing the variables that we're looking at here, it really comes down to how much time we're gonna have to make adjustments combined with how much stuff we can physically bring depending on what sort of transportation mode we're using. If it's a gig, it might only be 10 minutes and there's very little time to address much of anything. You just got to get through it as quick as you can. Whereas if it's a rehearsal studio scenario, you might have a little more time, more relaxed attitude and be able to adjust more of it. For me, and to mitigate these possibly very short amounts of time to be able to address issues, I always bring my own snare drum and my own bass drum pedal in addition to my cymbals. And this is because those are the other two items that are most likely to have something wrong enough with them that I can't fix it on the fly quickly. The first component to look at is what we can do purely through tuning and making adjustments to the drums themselves. This is pretty much what you're going to run into walking into a house drum set. Now I have chosen not to put my cymbals up yet because I want to have as much space as possible to manipulate the drums, turn them over if I need to, whatever, before we get to mounting them. This is also a great time to check and make sure that the cymbal stands and the hi-hat stand have felts on them, sleeves on them, everything you need to protect your instruments when you put them on there. We're going to start with the toms today. I focus on the rezzo side of the toms far more than the batter sides in these situations because nine times out of ten, the troubling sound I'm hearing out of them is because the rezzo has been ignored, it's gone crazy, and a lot of people have tried to tune the batter and still not got the sound they needed. Now if you sit down at the drums and they sound great, then we're good to go. However, if you're in between a couple of other bands on a night where there's a lot of bands playing, chances are that the drums have been hit a bunch and they're starting to sound a little crazy. And this is where we do rule number one, which is check out the rezos on the toms and the bass drum before you start adjusting anything on the batter sides. Resonant heads on house kits get a lot less attention. They can get wildly out of whack or possibly get tabletop tight and forgotten about. The only way to know is to flip the drum over and check and make sure. For example, this drum with a couple of lugs not particularly out of tune on the bottom head sounds like this. And with a slight tweak to that head and no change to the batter, we get this. This means to me that hitting a drum and deciding that the batter's out of tune, absolutely not worth the trouble at all. Check out the rezzo first because you're probably gonna get pretty close and then you can make adjustments to the batter if you need to. Something you may also run into is the discovery that people have been playing the resonant head and it's cratered up, it looks like the surface of the moon, and perhaps the head that's facing you on the batter side looks like it's in better shape. Crazy as it sounds, this might be time to flip the drum over and play the cratered side because the tone that we need is really coming from the resonant side of the drum and having a super trashed rezzo is gonna create issues that no amount of tuning is gonna fix. Moving on to the floor tom, common issue, missing tuning rod, especially on the bottom of the drum. It's a place where people go to steal one and put it somewhere else on the kit. Oftentimes the floor tom, rezzo is the one to suffer, and this can give us really dramatic and horrifying issues. Let's hear what this drum sounds like with one tension rod removed from the rezzo head.
And now let's hear what it sounds like when we put it back. That's a pretty severely dramatic difference just for moving one screw. And here's the funnest part of this whole thing. For the entirety of this video, there's been a tension rod removed from the batter head of the snare drum. We put it in there just to simulate the experience of needing to get one from somewhere else. What this means for us is that we need to remember that lower tension tuned drums are gonna have a much more adverse reaction to losing a tension rod. And if we need to get one from somewhere and there isn't maybe an extra tom we're not using or something like that, removing one from the batter head of your snare drum temporarily can get you still a very serviceable sound out of the snare and also save you from the crazy things that happen when you lose one on the floor tom. If you find yourself up against this situation, then let's look at the snare drum and choose a lug to take out. For me, it makes the most sense to be away from where I'm going to be playing rim shots, so the opposite side of the drum. And also, take into account that an 8-lug or 6-lug snare drum is going to also have a much bigger reaction, tension-wise, to removing one of the tension rods. So a 10-lug, it actually doesn't change it that much. 8-lug may be a little bit more of a sound change. If you do choose to borrow a tension rod from your snare drum, remember to add a little bit of tension to the rods adjacent to the one that you removed to bring a little more tension back into that area and even out the overtones. The other place that I see tension rods getting lost a lot, this happened to me last week on the road, was right next to the snare mechanism on the snare side. This is actually a very audible and very frustrating issue because it interferes with the ability of the snare wires to react from the head properly. So, this is another situation where you might want to take a rod from elsewhere just to make sure that those four are intact so you can have even response from the wires. Lastly, for the bass drum today, we recreated a scenario that we see a lot in both venues and rehearsal spaces, which is a ported front head and a very large pillow inside of the drum. When you have this set up, most of what there is to do is manipulate the positioning of the pillow to find a nice balance between muffling and tone out of the drum, even for a little bitty one like this. Once we've done all of our adjustments, it's worth checking around quickly and make sure that we're not hearing any metal on metal or rattling or any other sounds that might be of a concern. If we isolate something like that, there's a lug making noise, a little bit of gaff tape to temporarily hold it down, we'll take care of the problem. Once we move past the realm of tuning, there are other things we can do to manipulate the sound, especially if we're struggling with some overtones or getting more or less sustain than we need out of the drums. We have a previous episode where we dive deep into the sort of triage kit that I take to shows to make sure that I can fix as many of the problems that could show up as possible and get through the gig. There are a few other ones that are not featured in that video that we can talk about. The main thing that we definitely want to address is that we rarely, if ever, use muffling on the show here, but I am never, ever without muffling options on any gig ever, honestly, whether it's my drum set or not, simply because you may find yourself in a situation where a little muffling or a dramatic amount is going to actually make your job tremendously easier, and nowhere is that more true than using a provided house kit. Now that we've got the toms, the snare, and the kick sounding good, there are a myriad mechanical issues with the hardware on the kit that can rear up and make it really challenging to have a good gig. If you show up and the floor tom is missing a leg, this happens, you can shove a drumstick in the bracket underneath in a pinch. If you show up to the gig and the ball mount for the tom is absolutely stripped out and the tom won't stay up, poke around and see if there's an extra snare stand there to put that drum on. And if the snare stand you find is too big to hold the tom there, you can always use ISO mounts from TNR products. 
hold on to that drum, give you great tone. I've had experiences where a foot is missing from one of the legs on the floor tom and that metal on metal on the floor is just driving me crazy. It sounds terrible and I will use one of these from TNR products as well. It puts the tone back, acts like a foot and gets the job done. Probably the most common frustration is the bass drum sliding away when you're hitting it hard. If it doesn't have the feet, if it doesn't have spikes, if you're not on a carpet, like what are you going to do? Pretty much the last two years of videos that we've made here, we've used K-brakes for this exact reason because even on our carpet in here, it runs away. These are fantastic and they have options for both carpet and hardwood floors to keep that drum where it goes. They also work fabulously on hi-hat legs and anything else that you need to make sure stays put on stage as you're getting through the gig. If you're using the house hi-hat stand and it feels sticky, like there's maybe some grime or gunk in there, high likelihood that the post is actually bent and getting stuck along the way. The simplest way to check on this is to just loosen the post and twist it around and see if it's sticking in certain spots and not in others. Find a spot where it moves smoothly, you're good to go. Everything we've talked about today comes together in trying to get the best sound that we possibly can. And the fact of the matter is using different drums with different heads than we're used to and different stands in a different room, we're not gonna get the sound of our dreams in this situation. We're gonna try to get as close as we can so we can play our best and have the best show for the audience and everybody else in the band. This can be a bit of a mental struggle when you're first starting to do it or if you're uncomfortable and unused to this kind of situation, but it is absolutely doable and it's an opportunity to take these limitations and turn them into inspiration. Now, having said that, if you run into a kit, wherever it may be, it's worth mentioning anything that is particularly problematic about it to either the owner of the studio, the sound engineer at the venue, whoever it is that would have some influence over getting those issues repaired, because it's a high likelihood that the people in those positions don't know exactly what's wrong with it and might not even know how to go about fixing it. So we got to work on this all together and get the house kits better than they've been. Make sure you tell somebody if there's something tragically wrong with it so that it can get alleviated. The bottom line here is how do we be professional, courteous, and just get through everything that we need to no matter the state of the gear that we're using. The fact of the matter is that professionals know that the job needs to get done and they will do whatever they have to to get it done and not put it on anybody else, not make a big scene out of it, just get to the other side and have a great gig. This means for us not getting too bogged down in the details and making sure that we are prepared to fix things that might be wrong, prepare to hear and see drums that look unfamiliar and that might not be the sizes we're used to, and keep ourselves in the creative headspace so that we can have a great show, a great rehearsal, practice session, whatever it is. All right, thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see here, please head over to the Patreon where we have extended footage, anecdotes, lots of other content. It is the best way to help us continue to make these videos. If you are a person who has ever asked us to make anything ever, that's the place to help facilitate us making the things that you want to see. And lastly, please tell us about your house kit experiences. I would love to hear really bananas ones too. I know there are some out there. I have my own. Thanks.